Welcome to the Catholic Nerds Podcast, your binary source for quality Catholic nerdery. This is Scott. And Colby. And Eric Dumont. And very special guest today, we have Dr. Jennifer Roback Morse. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Dr. Morse. We, um, most, most of us Catholic nerds are from Louisiana, so we've been fans of yours from afar for quite some time now. And I know you may be wanting to get back to the motherland of California, but uh, we're so grateful for you to be here. She says no. She, she's, nay, shaking nay, she's shaking her head. Nay, she's, nay. she's no longer an honorary Cajun. She is an official Cajun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know about that, but, but but actually, I'm originally from Ohio. I'm actually a Buckeye. Oh, okay. So, so I understand your producer is from Michigan, but so I, I'll be on anyway, even though, you know. <laughs> I don't know about producer, but. <laughs> well, your guy up there who runs things, who runs the board or whatever it is he does, but I mean. Yeah, of Michigan. <laughs> uh, it, well, it's it's all good. Yeah, but we like being here in Louisiana. We left. We were in California almost twenty years, oh, wow. and we left in 20, 2015 because we just couldn't take it anymore. The the politics were just too crazy, and honestly, we got out at a good time. You know, I'm glad that we left when we did because things really deteriorated, and particularly around the whole. Um, COVID pandemic plus response to pandemic plus, you know, government overreach, blah, 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 blah. California has really become very unlivable. So I'm, I'm glad we, you know, extracted ourselves when we did. Well, we're very but, happy to have you here in Louisiana. Well, Some, you know, sometimes we suffer from the brain drain, but you're mm -hmm. an infusion for us. We yeah, well, I'm glad to do it. I'm glad to do it. But, uh, you know, a lot of people are leaving the coastal cities. You know, there's been a lot of big exodus out. The only problem here in Lake Charles, of course, is Laura, sure. you know, Hurricane Laura, Hurricane Delta. And as you guys may know, because you've had a few natural disasters over there in Baton Rouge yourselves, um, you know, people leave and a lot of times they don't come back. Mm -hmm. And so we're dealing with some of that, you know, and that the houses that are abandoned and, you know, that's a little demoralizing. But but I must say, and I say this all the time, you guys, um, I would rather be I would rather go through a natural disaster than a moral catastrophe. Oh, any wow. time. Yeah. And. You know, there are moral catastrophes all over the place in our world, you know, and, and being in Lake Charles, Louisiana, I'm pretty insulated from the worst of that stuff. Um, you know, we, we at the Ruth Institute, we're always fighting the good fight. So we're going around looking for fights. <laughs> but, but if but if we want to be peaceful, we can be peaceful. You know what I mean? You, you know, you're not you don't have the, the really worst stuff sure. in your face all the time. There's no abortion clinic in this town, just for awesome. one example, you know, um, so. You know, it's just a, a, a relatively peaceful existence, and most of the people around uh, around us are, are oblivious to a lot of things going on. You try to convince them, hey, you know what, you need to get involved, and they're like, what? You know, and I'm like, oh no, really, you really, you need to get involved. It would so, be nice uh, if we had a FEMA for moral catastrophes. Yeah, right. we yeah. do. We do have the mobile confessional based out of Lafayette with the CJC community. So there are That's some right. efforts to do something like that. Right. It's That's very right. interesting. That's you say, though, about it's it's a very easy way to to build structures and rebuild the infrastructure of a town. But the moral structure of a community or that area is, is a much difficult challenge, which I'm yes. sure we'll get into in some of our questions very soon. Sure. But, sure. Uh, yeah, it's yeah, insightful yeah. the way that you said that. Yeah, well, I, we, we can talk about whatever y'all want to talk about as long as you allow me to shamelessly plug our summit that's coming up. Please, Although this please. is being recorded, right? Yes. So when is it going to be? When is it going to be broadcast? we I would like to broadcast it this week, uh, so that we can do our little bit to help you promote the. Okay. Your, well, that'd be summit. swell. So, so we'll mention the fact that people can participate virtually because by yeah, that we, time we'll, we'll we the the cater the caterer's head count will be finished <laughs> most likely and, and you can't crash the joint even for our jambalaya and and bread pudding and all that good stuff that that you can only get in Louisiana. Oh, for sure. Would you? Yeah. Sorry, you Eric. Yeah, sorry, 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 Eric. In our <laughs> opinion, in our opinion, Yankee food has no taste. That's it, mm. right, fellas. I don't know if that's just opinion. Not that it has no <laughs> taste. The one, the one thing we got over, like Michigan has over the rest of the country, is yes. is Verner's. What a, a ginger ale? It's <laughs> mm -hmm. it's a ginger ale soda pop that is it's way better in Canada Dry or any other ginger ale you could ever find. It's like more pure ginger, Whoa. and it, it's it's so gingery 
that we don't consider it a pop in Michigan, it's medicine. Oh. So when you, you have an upset stomach, you get Verner's. Wow. You take that and you're fine. That's very <laughs> impressive. <laughs> there should be some scientific studies on it. But yeah. Like well, every time I've kidding. used it, Verner's is perfect. So okay, whenever fine. I come to visit you guys, I'm bringing a case. You know, okay. well, you guys whenever we it. come up there, we're bringing, <laughs> whenever we go up there, we're bringing Tony's sasheries in our, in our suitcase. Tony's right, sounds good. Buddha, some king cakes. <laughs> we'll bring everything. Yeah, nice. there you go. Nice. There you Do go. Dr. <laughs> Morris, would you run through the list of guests that y'all have coming to the summit? Because it's very impressive. How long do we have yeah. for me to go yeah. through the whole list of guests? <laughs> I, I, I put on a different kind of program than a lot of people do, you guys. I mean, a lot of times when people put on a conference, a Catholic conference, they'll have people that everybody's heard of. Right. And, and so people will come because, oh, I've heard of Father Calloway, or I've heard of this person or that person, you know, Scott Hahn, I've heard of these people, so I'm going to come and hear them. And each of those people will get, you know, a, a pretty substantial amount of time to talk. But, but we do it a little bit differently, because I have a sort of a whole pedagogical point I'm trying to make here. And we always have something like that. And so the way we have it set up, we have, um, we have the core training on Friday, uh, uh, all day Friday which is where if you want to get the core principles of the Ruth Institute, what we stand for, what we believe, the basis on which we operate, Friday's the day to, to come do that. And that's four basic talks um, and with a lot of q and A's. It's, it's going to be like a seminar kind of thing, you know? Um, and that's the same from year to year, pretty much we do mm. the same thing because the core principles don't change. So I'll be giving an, an address on understanding the sexual revolution. And that's based on my book, The Sexual State. Um, it's the same talk every year, but it's different every time <laughs> because you keep adapting things and learning things and, you know, dressing it up and stuff. But, but the core principles are from the sexual state. And then the second lecture will be from our um, senior research associate, Father Paul Sullins, who's associate, retired sociology professor, retired from uh, Catholic University of America. And he's going to give a, a talk called Counting the Casualties of the mm -hmm. Sexual Revolution and just kind of go through chapter and verse you know, this person, how many children are divorced and how many post-abortive women and, you know, just one thing after another, uh, you know, of the different ways that people have been harmed. And then after lunch on Friday, we'll have Dr. Quinton Van Meter, who's president of the American College of Pediatricians, which is a group that your, your people should know about. If they don't already, you should know about the AC PEDS. Um, and Dr. Van Meter will give a, a talk called the medical costs of the sexual revolution. So that will include you know, uh, the whole range of things such as STDs and um, hazards of, of uh, casual sex and uh, hazards of abortion. And then, of course, something about uh, the, the whole attempt to change the sex of the body, which is a medical disaster, you know, complete disaster. Sure. Um, and then the fourth of those talks will be um, a talk by my colleague Don Fetter uh, on demographic winter, the problems associated with population decline. Uh, and this is a talk where, you know, there aren't that many people who will talk about this subject, um, but the fact is everybody's been brainwashed into thinking we have too many people on the planet. And so we're just going to go right at that and, you know, take a whack at that tree and say, that's just completely crazy. That's just completely wrong that there are too many people and our, our big, we're going to have a lot of problems. Uh, associated with population decline. So that's day one. That's the core training. It's day one. That's full. <laughs> that, that's Quite a day. The yeah. Yeah. And, then, and then Friday night is our awards dinner. Um, and we all, this is a, also a key thing that we like to do. Uh, this is where we sometimes have people that you might have heard of. And so uh, the, the people we're giving awards to, you, you probably, you might have heard of some of them, but some of them you haven't heard of. Um, and that's deliberate. That's by choice. Um, the keynote speaker that night will be Kristen Hawkins, who is president of Students for Life of America. And a lot of people have heard of her because she, her organization has 1,200 stinking chapters around the country, okay? I mean, high schools, colleges, if you've got kids in that age range, you've heard of Kristen, <laughs> you know, uh, because she has had such an impact on so many people. So we're going to give her the Pro-Life Leadership Award and which we made up just for her and she'll be the keynote speaker that night um, and that's where you will get your great Louisiana cuisine and we do have people coming in from all over the place I'm sure just for the the, the seafood that we have and by the way in Lake Charles just so you just so you know in Lake Charles in our diocese um, 
uh, a meatless Friday is observed everywhere, you know. Good. And yeah. if I gave a dinner where we serve meat on Friday, no one would come. That's Goodness. awesome. Okay, I'm just saying no. Because <laughs> I'm pretty <laughs> sure, sure I'm the only one that ordered a fillet of fish today at McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> We, we, the first year I came here and we had the first time we did this dinner, you know, um, the people sent me these worried messages. So what are you serving for dinner? <laughs> Red snapper. It's going to be great. <laughs> um, so, um, awesome. so, so, so there's Kristen, we'll get an award. And then um, we always give an award to some kind of expert, some kind of ex activist and some kind of witness. And this is really the three part structure that we have in our summit for survivors of the sexual revolution. The concept of survivors of the sexual revolution implies that people have been harmed, right. that there's something that, that you have to um, navigate and get over and, and, and not be killed by, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so the witnesses are people who have experienced some aspect of it, either self-inflicted or inflicted by others and who are now willing to talk about it and tell the whole truth about what it was really like, which of course you will never see in the mainstream media or in a sitcom or you know anything like that. You'll never, you'll never see anybody who's been harmed by any of these things, it's always jolly mm -hmm. divorced couples and gay Even couples and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Right, um, and then we always have somebody who has some kind of expertise um, and then we always honor some activists. And so the witness of the year this year is Mr. Walt Heyer, and some people may have heard of Walt Heyer because he, he's very well known to people who have uh, delved into the whole issue of, of transgenderism and whether it's possible to change the sex of the body. Uh, Walt is now in his 80s and he was one of the earliest people to attempt to live as a woman. And he lived as a woman, presented himself as a woman, did a whole bunch of surgeries and things to his body. Um, and after eight years of that, realized it wasn't solving his problems. It wasn't making him happy. And so he walked it back and had a profound conversion experience. And now he and his wife um, help other people who are mm -hmm. dealing with this, either people who've been through it and are trying to detransition or people who's, who are considering doing it or their kids are considering doing it and they're trying to figure out you know, how, to, how, how to survive it. So Walt is... Uh, Walt and Walt is just he's a wonderful human being and his wife is a wonderful human being and you should come just to shake their hands you know yeah. <laughs> I think you know because I, they're just they're just great people I wish um, we had more people that had survived this to live to tell others the, the cautionary tale but exactly get a lot exactly. of them. And, 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 you know, Scott, that's why we try to give a microphone to people in these situations, you know, so yeah. um, we've got others later in the day, you know, the next day we've got more. Um, and in past years, in past years, for instance, we had, we've had survivors of divorce. One year we did a whole, a whole panel on divorce and mm -hmm. listened to adult children of divorce and abandoned spouses and you know, you know, you never hear their stories. Oh, you yeah. know, you, you, you never hear. And your book does such a good job that, you know, the first chapter, I guess, first chapters of, you know, going through those kinds of eyewitness testimonies yeah. of the revolution. Yeah. Um, and your book, your book is just awesome for being systematic in its approach, but at the same time, very digestible. So people, it, I, I feel like it's a great book to arm people. Well, thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. It's, 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 that's my book, The Sexual State. Yeah, thanks for having that background there. Which we will also link in the show notes. Yes, make sure we'll do that too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that'll be on sale. And actually, we'll be giving it to some of our other speakers and things like that. And Tan Books is a sponsor of the, of the conference. Um, oh, cool. They, they gave us, they're not going to be able to come and do a table but they gave us a very nice discount on these books that we're going to be, you know, selling and giving away and so on. And, so and there's a um, audio book version of it now too, which is also very good. Oh, is there really? Yes. Yeah. I didn't know that. Well, yeah. I've been listening to you, to her, <laughs> your, the narrator all day. <laughs> all right. Very good. Very, well, I didn't read it. Oh, okay. It's not my voice. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. No. <laughs> yeah. I figured if you didn't know the audio version was out there, you probably didn't read it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Good thinking. Good thinking. So, um, so, so yeah, so that's, that's Walt. 
um, the public witness of the year. And then I'm going to give an award for activism to mm. these two women who have an organization that they call Advocates Protecting Children. And these are two women, basically two moms who are on fire on the trans issue. That's Aaron and, and Maria, right? Exactly. How do you know Aaron, Aaron and Maria, Scott? We're interviewing them Monday. Oh, no. Did, had you already heard of them or did you hear of them through me? No, I only, only heard about them through the summit. Oh. Yeah. All right. There you All go. Right. Mission accomplished. Yeah, There's a feather in your cap. So <laughs> that's what we want. We want, you know, these are people who deserve more attention than they're getting, yes. you know. Yeah. I mean, you know, no offense to Catholic celebrities and celebrity priests and stuff, but they don't need my help. Yeah. <laughs> no, they don't. You know, they don't. They don't need, you know. So, but Aaron and Maria, it says this is Aaron Brewer, Maria Keffler, two moms, and they are um, for different reasons. Um, and they each have their personal reason, but they are on fire about the trans issue. And I literally cannot keep up with these women. They have written books. They have a podcast. They uh, appear in front of state legislatures to testify. They have picketed in front of gender clinics. Wow. That's That's awesome. Okay. okay I haven't even begun women. to think about picking in front of gender clinics, you know? I mean, I've lots of uh, lots of that in front of abortion clinics, but I haven't wrapped my mind around that yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh uh, I tell you, you get into that issue. It is, it is ghoulish. Mm. It is ghoulish. Some of the things that are going on. And, and I predict that sooner or later, there are going to be a raft of lawsuits. Oh, wow. I, I certainly hope so. I mean, because it's just, it's horrible what's going I, on. But it, I don't mean to be ghoulish myself, but if, if there's a good personal injury case, I think that would be <laughs> an awesome way to take down some of these. Oh. No question. Yeah. No question about it. No question about it. I, I yeah. and and there, if there aren't, there should be there. And and there are people trying, but I, I, you know, so far the right set of things hasn't come up. It's it's more complicated than it looks. I guess since you're an attorney, you're probably aware of that. that well, that's um, the problem with with using the law to fight abortion clinics is because they just lease everything. They have no assets. They have nothing to go after. Oh, is that so? I didn't realize that. Oh, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Well, so there are a lot of different nooks and crannies to 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 doing this. Hide in, yeah. You know? Yes, yeah. yeah, it's, it's the the skirting the system and say in the risk management institute. So it's transferring of risk a different ways, so you have to avoid it. Um, but even just in, not from a legal standpoint, but from a financial standpoint, um, the redefinition of elective procedure or people choosing to do things voluntarily with their bodies is now being forced into the financial system of health insurance, which it was for, not designed to do. For for the trans issue, right? Yes. So trans, even other yeah, medical issues that were not really designed for a risk transfer uh -huh. um, that are being forced into the system, which also inflates the cost for the general public. Yeah. So yeah. tell, pe tell people a little bit about that, because for a long time, I thought, gosh, maybe the insurance companies will put the kibosh on this <laughs> yeah. thing. What? You know, wh why don't the insurance companies say um, we demand proof that the person really has gender dysphoria? We demand proof that they're not mentally ill in some other way because it'd be so sure. much cheaper to deal with it some other way. Why? Why, why is that, Colby? Why, why don't There's they a, do that? It's challenging. Um, so with the passing of the Affordable Care Act, right, some years ago, there were a lot of things. Obamacare. That were... Let's be clear. Obamacare. Okay. Okay, Obamacare. Right? We'll say it. Right. We're in this forum. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry, my uh, my institutional Sorry. and academic brain is trying to call technicals. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> but true. yeah, there's there's been this shift over the last ten to twenty years to again to redefine or to shift things that were not necessarily designed from a health perspective to recategorize them as health care. So I we see. see this very commonly with abortion, right? So a lot of the arguments say that's not necessarily health care. Um, those are now being those precedents and those issues are being traced to transgender issues. So what used to be considered elective procedure, uh, in many cases, if you do have a doctor who has prescribed, right, or has justified that through their evaluation, you can proceed through this procedure or these hormone therapies, whatever, because it is an appropriate use of your right to healthcare. I see. It then forces it into the system, which is not designed nor priced to really do efficiently. Um, but the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare uh, tried to, it's actually explicitly in the law to socialize the risk of all health categorizations to eliminate the need for medical underwriting. 
So what does that mean in plain English? What does that mean, Coley? So instead of being able to calculate actuarially what it actually costs for healthcare in this country, making everything categorized as healthcare that will be serviced by a doctor or in a healthcare facility makes it easier to calculate what the cost of health is just from a national standpoint. And it's still kind of high level, but um, the more things we can categorize as healthcare, the easier it is to estimate the cost of it instead of individually trying to price risk per person. So hmm. socialized, socialized medicine, essentially. Hmm. Hmm. So, hmm. so if it's, if it's covered, we just, uh, we just calculate how many people are going to end up needing it, we think, and, uh, and, and that's what it costs. We, we're going to pay it no matter what. Or proportionality, because I mean, right. I'm not sure exactly the, the numbers or the percentages for people that identify as transgender or, you know, other gender dysphoria, but relatively speaking, the proportion of people in the population is small. Mm -hmm. However, the cost of those procedures or the cost of those therapies is very expensive. Right, right, right. So, and, you know, one of the things that we hear from distraught parents, right, because distraught parents find their way into our little network of Maria and Aaron and me and, you know, some of our friends and stuff. One of the things we hear is that the, the school counselors will put their teens, their, their, their teens onto Medicare, or mm -hmm. Medi Medicare, Medicaid, mm -hmm. on Medicaid. Um, okay. so that these procedures can be covered without the parent's knowledge or approval and so on. So yep. that's, how they, exactly. that's how they get around all that. You know? So I'm in several insurance professional forums where people either on Reddit or others that they seek out advice. One of the most common questions is from usually teenagers seeking out procedures or therapies without the consent of their parents on their mm -hmm. health plan. Mm -hmm. And so ethically, it's very difficult to give them advice because I really don't want to give them the advice. Right, uh, right. But there are, unfortunately, there are ways for minors to seek medical treatments outside of their parents' consent. Right. It usually that, depends on the state, but yeah, in many yes. cases they can. And that's been part of the sexual revolution for a long time. We're getting, yeah. we're getting off the topic of my summit, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> which we want to go back to. But this is a really interesting point. In my opinion, this is a very interesting point because um, people ask me, Dr. Morris, where did this transgender thing come from? Oh, you know, it's like, well, wait, it didn't just drop out of nowhere. Um, for a long time, the federal government has required doctors to give contraception and abortion to teens, to, you know, to anybody over puberty um, without their parents' knowledge or consent. That's been going on a long time. Isn't that right, Colby? That is. Yes. Yeah. OK, so I'm not making that up. I put that in the sexual state, by the way. That is in the book. <laughs> so it, so it's on topic in that respect. And, do you know, I, I'm sorry in a way that we didn't discover you last year, Colby, because last year the theme of the. Uh, of the summit this year, you know, well, never mind. Last year, <laughs> the theme of the summit was reclaiming the professions for life and marriage. Mm -hmm. And we had a whole panel of doctors. You know, we had Dr. Dr. Van Meter and um, somebody from the um, uh, pro-life OBGYNs and the Catholic Medical Association and so on. These people who feel they have to form their own organizations yeah. because their professions have just gone completely down the tubes, you know, completely corrupted. It's been hijacked. Um, Completely, completely. Yeah. So having the perspective of an insurance person, that's really interesting. You know, that's a really interesting. When you come, because you guys are coming, right? We'll, we'll be when there next come, Saturday. Yeah, yeah. When you come, we'll have to introduce you to Dr. Van Meter. Um, and I don't know what, whether, what other physicians will be there, but I just think that it will be an interesting connection um, for you guys, you know, too. And, and this is another reason people should come to the summit. You will meet very interesting people, yeah. not just the presenters, but the people in the audience are very sure. interesting. You yeah, know, so. great point. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, where were we? It, 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 we you, keep... you were introducing the second day of speakers. Oh, and, yeah. no, no, no you were speaking about the different awards you were handing. I hadn't even finished the doggone yeah. awards. We're still on day <laughs> one. Not guys. to add <laughs> one more interruption too, but uh -oh. if uh -oh. and we should also go over if, if you can't make it the you yeah, can virtual. go to the summit virtually that's true that's yeah. thank you for bringing that up eric is salivating over, over this virtual <laughs> pass thing because he's not coming down from michigan i don't know yeah. what's wrong with him that he's not coming down from michigan but oh well yeah. <laughs> uh, is it the gas prices at like uh, 520 where I live? <laughs> yeah. so so yes there's a virtual pass and we'll be selling those virtual passes even past the day of the summit and i'll tell you why because it, it uh, entitles you to watch it in real time. And when you're watching it in real time, live stream and all that, you can ask questions, you know, you can type into the cool. chat and you can participate in that way. But then at, when the summit is over, 
you will receive a link to the raw video footage. Um, so in advance of it being produced and put up online and so on and so forth, ultimately all of that stuff will be online. It'll be free, um, but it's going to take a while, you know, for it to all be processed and stuff, you know, so you'll have immediate access to it. And we would recommend that to people who might want to write stories about it, you know, any journalists or anything like that, if you want to cover it and you want to be able to see, well, what the heck did they say? Um, you know, then you can go back and, and, and look and review uh, that content. So Eric, thanks for bringing that up. I, I, I really hope that a lot of people will watch virtually. We've got somebody who's going to be tuning in from India, it looks like. We nice. sold the pass to somebody in India. Fantastic. <laughs> So, um, but anyway, one last award I got to tell you guys, since this is a Catholic nerd show, oh, yeah, I have saved the nerdiest award for last. Wonderful. Ooh, she's prepared. The All right. Are you ready? Okay. <laughs> this is the Ruth Institute Scholar of the Year. And um, I invented this award for Mark Regneris back in the day, back in 2018, the first time we did it. You know who Mark Regneris is, you guys? No, heard his name, oh, but not what, from England. Oh, what kind of nerds are you? Oh, Apparently, not good ones. Come on, come on. <laughs> no. We're too nerdy about right, the topics we we're our, nerdy about. We got our cards here. We have to, <laughs> yeah, we have to punch out a hole every time we, we don't live <laughs> up to is, our name. <laughs> this this is a different um, zone of nerdiness. Okay, so Mark Regnerus is a sociologist at the Inter University of Texas Austin, and oh, that's he, why I don't know him. I'm a Texas Aggie. So. Oh. Oh God! Oh, okay. Dear. I'm. Oh dear. Oh dear. We're not no. stepping into that. No, no, no. And we got to stop you. So our running joke also is Scott is so <laughs> proud of being Aggie, he has to find a way to drop it into every episode, and you just cheat him <laughs> up for it. I uh, either yeah, you teed that up perfectly. Either I I could either talk about the wonders of Texas A and M or the horrors of the University of Texas. One or the other. <laughs> well, all right, all right then. So you'll like this story. So. So Dr. Agneris years ago was the guy who wrote the definitive, very, very solid study showing that children of same-sex parents actually have problems. Mm -hmm. And for that, he was pilloried. He was, he was, it was horrible what was done to him and not just by his university. It was a nationwide. Yeah, I've read, I've read that and study. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So now that I'm saying that you remember that. So anyway, um, in 2018, he was finally, he is the most investigated professor in all of the United States, I'm sure. Wow. And wow. he has sailed through, he has come through. And in 2018, he finally got promoted to full professor. <laughs> and so I said, doggone it, we're gonna, we're gonna sing to the rooftops to congratulate Mark Regneris for finally getting promoted because nobody else will, you know, I mean. Oh, I was thinking you were saying Margaret Harris. You're saying Mark Regneris. Mark, Mark. 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 Gotcha, all right. Yeah, it's a sure. guy, Mark Regneris, very Latin sounding name. Like, <laughs> you know, you could have a plural of Regneri. You know, um, but <laughs> but but anyway, Mark Mark's not coming this year. That was just a nerdy thing for me to tell you that that that's why I started it. That's what inspired me to do it. Oh, so wonderful. this year, the guy I picked this year is um, uh, Professor Scott Yenner from Boise State University, who's a political philosophy professor, um, and he has written two different books on the family in political philosophy in one way or another. Um, and and in, one, in one of his books, he, he literally goes through all of the major modern political philosophers, starting from Hobbes and Locke and John Stuart Mill and Rousseau and all these people. And he asks, what do they have to say about marriage and family? And the short answer is they have no idea what they're talking about. No. You know, they just, they just, they're crazy until you get to the very last chapter and he finds one philosopher who knows something. And that philosopher turns out to be Carol Wojtyla, mm -hmm. Pope John Paul II, before he was a bishop. So I, when I read this book, I said, who is this guy? Who is this guy, Yenner? How is it that I don't know him? Is he Catholic? How, 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 how do I not know him? Wait, he's in Idaho and he has five kids. Maybe he's Mormon. <laughs> oh, yeah. anyway, anyway, so I looked him up. We got acquainted. It turns out he's Missouri Synod Lutheran. And, okay. um, and he's still writing in this area. And he's done really important work just explaining philosophically what the, the political philosophical implications of a lot of the things that we're accepting as gospel truth. Hmm. Um, and after I picked him out to get this award and everything, uh, I found out that he was almost canceled by his university. Oh, wow. Because in Boise State, he'd be safe because Idaho is like the most densely 
red state, you know? Like, well, the, the good old boys don't all go to university, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. That's um, very true. Yeah. Academia has been blue washed across the country. Mm. Yeah, but he so he said something mean about feminism and the students went bonkers and the university administration went bonkers and so on and so forth. But once again, he has triumphed. He has survived it and stuff. So we'll we'll uh, drink a toast to wonderful <laughs> Dr. Dr. Rent, Dr. Yenner. But he he's one of the most interesting things he has to say is to say that the modern world has no room for love. Mm. You know that that when you if your if your <clears throat> if your view is that everybody is an autonomous individual and everybody's independent and that that's what it means to be a, a, an adult person is to be independent. Well, why do you need love? What is the you purpose know? of exactly. relationships? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah there, there's no room for any of that. You know, and 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 he's correct. I think he's completely correct. So anyway, um, he's a really um, good guy. And then so that's Friday. That's the first day. You, and you guys aren't even coming Friday. No, we're missing all the good stuff. <laughs> so, so do you want to hear about Saturday? Or you could just wait until you get there and see if you like it. I really, I really want to ask you about no fault divorce. Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, you know what? You can post a link to the to the sure. to what's oh gonna absolutely. Happen, yeah. To what's gonna happen so people can see what we're gonna talk about. We're not going to do a huge amount about divorce, but we can talk about that. Um, what do you want to ask about? Well, uh, if you could kind of trace out how we suddenly had no fault divorce in the U.S., just, you know, uh, I can link to your book to have, if you want the full story, but then how we can fight it. Because yeah. if, if I were to ever get into politics, that would be the, the singular issue I'd want to fight, assuming abortions already um you know gone the the way of the dodo that might be a right. big assumption and i have a somewhat related question too it's kind of theoretical but um so around the idea of no fault divorce also the purpose of a marriage license so it seems like possibly back in the day when you had to apply for a marriage license there actually was work involved in some type of effort and there were things that were around that but today it just seems like it's a administrative thing that you just have to do and sign in order to have a civil relationship with someone so well i uh, don't know much about i don't know much about marriage licenses i, I can't really speak to that part of it but sorry. but what i can say something about is about no fault divorce and that is something that did seem like it came out of nowhere and yet when it happened the first state to do it was california in 1968 and by 1975 pretty much every state except new york had it mm -hmm. um and and, and it, it was through the American Law Institute, I think, a lot as ways the kind of the, techni the technical way that it happened state by state. And of course, family law is all state law anyway, so it's not going to be a federal thing and there's not going to be a federal fix for it. But the thing that's interesting about it is that it was presented to the public as a great increase in freedom, you know, because you don't have to stay in a loveless marriage. And, um, and you don't have to, it's so much cheaper to get divorced if two sensible people want to call it quits, then they don't have to prove fault and they don't have to pre present evidence and so on and so forth. Well, what nobody seemed to have predicted is that if you treat the, the guilty and the innocent the same way, you're gonna end up with more people committing marital faults. <laughs> you know, you're gonna end up with more guilty uh, conduct that you would have previously sanctioned. You know, you're, you're, you're not sanctioning, you're gonna get more of it. Econ 101 there, right, Colby? Um, and, and so, so that's part of it. And the other part of it is that no one seems to want to admit that what it really is, is unilateral divorce. Now, meaning sure. one person can say, I want to end the marriage. And the state always, literally always takes sides with the person who wants the marriage the least. Okay. Sure. There's no other area of law where that's true, where you walk into a courtroom and you know in advance who wins, you know, that, that just, um, and when you, then when you think about that, you ask, well, is it true that it's always a sensible couple deciding to call it quits and by mutual agreement? When you ask that question, which of course, very few people even ask that question, but we ask that question, you know, what percentage of divorces take place by mutual consent? And the answer is 25% at most wow. take place by mutual consent. So that means that there's a reluctant party always, and that means the state has to enforce the divorce, yeah. right? And, and forcibly separate that person from the assets of the family. 
and all of the assets of the family, the financial assets and the human assets, meaning the time spent with your children, all of that now is in the hands of the family court. So it turns out to be a massive transfer of power to the state and nobody recognizes this. Yeah, it's a legal application of violence in the family. What's that? Is that a legal application of violence to separate family? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's exactly what it is. I mean, if you decide you're going to get divorced, if you get the family court involved, you are involving people with guns in your family. And you said something to the effect of an unprecedented level of intrusiveness into the family, state sanctioned intrusiveness. Right. Right. Exactly. Now, so so now let me go back to our summit on sure, Saturday, sure. because this is a highly structured day this Saturday. We were talking about that? Or... <laughs> okay. Okay. We were talking about that? A yeah, summit. we were. If, I, if I can, <laughs> if I can maybe yeah. ask a clarifying question to what I asked earlier. So the example yeah. would be, say, like Louisiana marriage licenses. Yes. Uh, so in Louisiana, we do have the option to choose either, say, a no-fault option or a covenantal marriage. Yes, yes. And so, like you said, it's to the state. However, it's like they give the couple the option do you want an easy out or do you want to have to jump through a couple of hurdles to be able to get out? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so it's, yeah, but it's still, right. it's placed on the, the couple to make that people, choice. Maybe 10 people a year choose to do covenant marriages in Louisiana. We, we were one right. of them, but yeah. yeah. That's right. That's it. That, no, that's exactly right. And that's a very interesting question as to why not, Sure. you know, and to, and, and, and to what would happen if you should get divorced, you know, if, if one party and that wants to get divorced, what would the state end up doing? You know, how would it be handled in the family court? I don't know the answer to that. I think ours, so there actually were some guidance that was offered when we did ours, but it said you had to submit to counseling. consensual counseling for a period of time. And then and you also almost had to have a prescription from a licensed marriage counselor to say like, yes, these people should separate. Uh -huh. So there are, again, extra steps that you have to do to do it. But, <clears throat> uh, but again, it's voluntarily chosen by the couple, not necessarily and right. enforcement of the state. And, and I remember I remember when that first came in that it was it, it felt like a big victory. It felt like, wow, this is really cool. But it seemed like it was more symbolic. Now, you know, now as things have played out, it's, that yeah. appears to be the case. What do you think, Scott? It, it was. I mean, I know the it was Kitty Kimball and then uh, who was Chief Justice. Um, and we had some great jurists, like the top minds for uh, for family law in Louisiana that, that put that together. Um, I, but that's the question is how do you, how do you go back? How do, yeah. and that's what, yeah. if there are any well, initiatives. Yeah, out yeah, there, it, it would, it would help if the Catholic church would say, if you're going to get married in a Catholic church, mm. covenant marriage is Catholic marriage. And mm. unless you check off the covenant marriage box, you're not getting married in this church. Ooh. And that's and that's the problem is that the people that created covenant marriage in Louisiana weren't Catholic, um, oh. so I don't know if we have the same definition of covenant. Yeah. Right, right. But <laughs> but it, it it corresponds roughly to the Catholic position, right? That marriage is for life, and that and that the presumption is that it's permanent. And so you know your pastor could, in principle, yeah. pastors could say all kinds of things in principle that they aren't saying you know they could say hey you guys you, i see here you two have the same address hmm uh <laughs> we're calling off the marriage prep until you separate okay come on you guys get yeah. serious i mean i don't know For at sure. this point that that, that that horse has left the barn so long ago I, I don't know what the you know the clergy would i don't know what how people would react <laughs> but it's a mess i mean that's that's a component yeah. of the mess that well, i think even even our marriage coordinator when we did ours we we took it as a pretty serious step and a decision mm -hmm. that we had to make. It wasn't even a question for us, but when we mentioned it to them, they're like, oh, that's nice. That's really interesting. That's, I'm glad y'all did that. So it was- The clergy who prepared you said that? Our, our marriage coordinator at the parish. Yeah. 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 There was- So a... anyway, we, here's, here's the way we're going to talk about no-fault divorce in the context of the conference, okay? The oh, summit, okay. The Survivor Summit, okay? Um, the very first thing that's going to happen on Saturday morning is I'm going to get up and give a 15 minute speech on defending traditional sexual values like a pro. And, and when you come and you sit through the whole day, at the end of the day, you're going to get a flash drive. We just made it today. You're going to get a flash drive that has my slides on it, that has the script on it, that has a recording of me doing it, that has a bunch of resources on it, you know, so that you can defend traditional Christian sexual ethics like a pro. 
that you can do this without apology, without fear that you can, mm-hmm. because this is the fundamental issue, you know, and way back in the day, uh, before Roe v. Wade, there was a guy in Cincinnati, Dr. Jack Wilkie, who had a set of slides showing fetal development. And he, lots of people used those slides to go around and talk about the central issue, which is the life in the womb. What is it that's in the womb? And what we want to talk about is what is marriage and why do we need it? And what is the purpose of human sexuality? We got to keep this issue alive. You know, after, after the Obergefell case, the whole marriage movement pretty much threw up its hands and said, oh, well, <laughs> we tried. Oh, well, this is too hard. We're going to do something else, you know. Yeah. Um, so after I give that talk, then uh, there'll be um, at some point, I forget exactly what order it's going to be in. Uh, the three big ideologies that are in the book, The Sexual State, well, I'll have uh, different experts talking about each one of those. So we'll have Dr. Steve Baskerville talking about the divorce ideology and the harm that it does. And we'll have Father Shannon Bouquet, whom you guys may know, he's Mm -hmm. president of Human Life International and also a a Louisiana boy made good. You know, he's been home I I was a parishioner of his for a year. He's a phenomenal person. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, so, um, uh, so Father Bouquet is going to talk about the contraceptive ideology. Um, and then I'm going to bring in Katrina Zeno, who's a big theology of the body person, to talk about the gender ideology. So we'll you know, just kind of lay that out with a little more depth in each one of those things and give people something to chew on, you know, something to, um, something to get the wheels turning. And then we'll have a whole panel on learning from the past, uh, where uh, a guy named Arnold Culbreth, who worked with Dr. Wilkie, is going to talk oh. about going to talk about the early days of the pro-life movement and uh, my friend pastor jim garlow is going to talk about working on prop eight what was that like um you know so the whole panel on, on the past prop um, eight was the california measure um to outlaw same-sex marriage is that to to, to put man woman marriage into the constitution mm-hmm. of, Cal- of the state of california and by the way let me remind you we won that election yeah. Mm-hmm. Just for the record, we won the election. It was taken from us by the courts, as you know, as everybody knows. So, so, uh, so that's the past, um, you know, learning from the past panel. Um, and then we'll have, um, gee, and then at some point, the uh, Aaron and Maria are going to get to talk for 45 minutes about activism and yeah. the trans issue. And then we'll have somebody talking about, and then we'll have Walt Heyer giving a talk about how change is possible. And then we'll have a few, um, uh, what, do, what do you want to call it? We'll, we'll talk about uh, ex-gays, ex-gays. You know, I, I hate that term, but um, uh, Paul Darrow, who, um, who lived a, a gay lifestyle, who was a, a, an international fashion model and uh, walked away from the gay lifestyle. He's a big fan of Mother Angelica. His story mm. is great. Um, and then a, a, a black woman who lived a lesbian lifestyle for years. Uh, and she got fed up with it and walked away. Um, it, it's uh, Charlene Cothran. So she'll be giving her testimony. And Father Sullins will be giving a paper, some of his uh, sociological results on how um, sexual orientation change therapy doesn't hurt people, right? That, um, that trying to help people with so-called conversion therapy, um, which the, the bad guys are trying to ban, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. um, that, that that therapy is not harmful. That therapy is actually helpful to mm. people. So, and then and then the very last panel um, is going to be uh, uh, different ways of talking about different aspects of healing. So we'll have a couple, a young married couple who uh, have a ministry to adult children of divorce, and mm. they'll talk about their ministry and what they do. Um, so that's something for survivors. And then we'll have um, Mrs. Lori Hoy whose husband, Walter, she and Walter, Walter Hoy and Lori Hoy, they're very, very big in the, in the, um, uh, the black pro-life movement. Mm-hmm. Okay. And Lori's going to talk about the post-abortive congregation. This is one of the things that she and Walter have discovered in dealing with, you know, trying to deal with abortion in the black community. Um, people don't realize African Americans are deeply religious people. They take their Christianity very seriously. If you walk into a church, half the congregation is post-abortive, mm. right? And wow. including the pastor, maybe, right? Mm. Um, and so, it, it, so Lori and and Walter have thought through. Well, how do you deal with that? You know, how do you help them heal so that they can then 
you know, really take a stand for the, for the, for the unborn. So those are some of the things that we're going to be talking about. Do you think you can stand all that? All those topics are fascinating. It's a lot, of, a lot of context yeah. change, but all very beautiful things. I know. I know. And that's why we record it all. So people can come back to it, you know, and, and um, drink from that wealth some more. I mean, people are still watching the videos we made in 2019. Oh, you know, so. To your point earlier about, you know, the summit can take on very similar topics, but different ways, because over time we learn new things or have different insights about the similar topic. So our That's understanding, right. our understanding is constantly growing. That's right. And, and with the, the topics of the sexual revolution, it's so broad. I mean, there are so many different topics. There's so many different aspects. We generally don't do very much on abortion because other people have that covered. Sure. You know, there's a whole pro-life movement and um, the, the things that we deal with, nobody else is dealing with, right? So, um, so we try to, um, you know, be strategic in that sense. But obviously, all of the issues are connected, you know, so. I guess I, I have one more. Since we got you know, like 10 minutes left, Scott-ish. I don't know. Like what? That. Yeah, that sounds good. I just wanted to get at least one question in. There you <laughs> go. All right. <laughs> um, with... With a lot of things going on in the United States today, do you think like the issue of like transgenderism and, and things are getting more spotlight now? Um, especially with like, uh, for example, um, the Daily Wire uh, has that new documentary, What is a Woman mm -hmm. uh, by Matt Walsh. Mm -hmm. um, I've watched it, great documentary. Um, people like Scott Nugent, who, who was a woman who transitioned to a man um showing off like she had bottom surgery so like this portion of her arm was taken off just to fashion some kind of genitals i guess right 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 uh talk about think, ghoulish talk about yeah, ghoulish. yeah. yeah. Just yeah. after watching that documentary it just it makes my skin crawl mm -hmm. and scott talking about like it's the surgeries like that were like seventy thousand dollars going kind of going back to like these kids getting medicaid just to to go through it seventy thousand dollars a pop and that's i mean that's our money that's our tax right. money going to right. pay for that and stuff do you think there there is more spotlight it, spotlight on it now like the evils of it or do you think we're still we're still kind of growing in that well, I, I, more compared to what, Eric? I mean, what? what... It, I mean, I guess uh, from, you know, uh, 10, 10, 20 years ago. Um... Well, 10 to 20 years ago, they weren't thrusting it on kids. I mean, that's what's right. new. That's what's really new. And, and, and mm -hmm. what I would say is that after the court redefined marriage so that the whole gay marriage issue was settled by the, by the courts, the whole sexual revolutionary infrastructure turned its attention then to transgenderism. So if you look at the organizations promoting it, there are some new ones, you know, there are some that weren't deeply involved in gay marriage, but, but, but a lot of the big ones, you know, like human rights campaign and stuff like that, um, they are now focusing their attention on the trans issue. And it, it, you know, you might wonder why they do that, but, but in any case, for whatever reason they're doing it, that is what's happened, you know? So they, they got their big victory. Now they're moving on to the next step. The next step is um, to undermine the sex of the body even further. And so all of the money that they raised during those campaigns for, to redefine marriage, all of that money they raised, all of the relationships they built with the, the media, all of the social capital that they have on their side of people just assuming that anybody who resists them is a horrible person. You know, that, that's a big kind of um, um, social infrastructure, you could say, you know. So they took all of that artillery and just rotated it a few degrees and boom, now they're transing kids, you know, with all of that, with all that effort. And so that's why it's in the public square, you know, mm. because it's the next phase. They got what they wanted and now what's yeah. next? What's so it's, the next just follow, it's just following the money. Well, I mean, the money's important. Y yes, the money's important, but, uh, but I think it is important to ask, what do these people really want? Yeah. Um, and one of the things they really want is, is the sex of the body offends them. Okay, the fact that we're male and female is offensive to them because we can't really be equal, right? Because we're, it's, the differences are significant enough that you can't be equal. Yeah. So that whole equalitarian thing is troubled, you could say, by the, uh, by the sex of the body. And 
even the free market libertarian type people, they're offended by the fact that you can't have a baby by yourself. You know, mm -hmm. you have to have the cooperation of another person, dog on it. You know, you just do. Yep. And so um, the sex of the body is troublesome to the modern ideologies, right? And so if you think about what's what redefining marriage did, redefining marriage was really taking gender out of the marriage institution. Okay, so if you degender marriage, what's left? You know, it, 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 because marriage is the institution for procreating and procreating children, educating children, attaching children to their parents. So we're not going to do that anymore, right? We're going to say that yeah. that's something that can be, take, take place without regard to the sex of the body, which is, you know, biological nonsense. It's like a trade it's, union of birthing employers, birthing persons or something. Yeah, yeah. It's so, 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 so it, it, it's not a surprise that trying to literally say that the sex of the body is a matter of personal choice rather than something given to you that it's not completely surprising that that's their next step and and they're not going to stop until they've completely removed sex gender male female anything that has to do with male female they want to remove all of that from social life and the law that, that's what they want to do um and at the end of the game also is trans transhumanism okay mm -hmm. to to remake the body as a, you know, that the, the person is some kind of a amalgam of yeah. technology and, Chimera, and, and flesh, you know? I want to ask you just one of the things that Pope Paul VI likely had some foresight into when he wrote Humani Vitae, which is coming up for the anniversary, is, mm -hmm. you know, man's growing intellect will eventually lead him to try to manipulate his own body, not just for contraceptive means, but again, above and beyond to other things. Um, and the idea of transhumanism I actually was having a conversation with a friend recently about that. And it's man has forgotten that we are already like God to try to be godlike. Mm -hmm. So it's, mm -hmm. we're already made in the image likes of God. It's just people forget and we need to try to evangelize and remind them of that. That's right. That's right. And I think, you know, this is a good time because we're, you know, we're winding down here, but it's a good time to say um, that this is a great time to be a Catholic actually, because the, the problems people are trying to solve, the problems people have created for themselves can't be solved by science. They can't be solved by more democracy. They can't be solved by more free speech. You know, but, but we're losing free speech. We're losing democracy. We're losing science, right? We're losing all of that stuff we're so proud of. And, and honestly, the, the Catholic understanding of the human person is what is needed to really solve these problems that's what's been lost that's what needs to be recovered that's what needs to be restored in some way but it, but it can't we can't go back to restore it we have to recover it and move it forward because because this is the way knowledge works this is the way um experience works you can never go back to you know let's go back to the 1950s well no it doesn't work like that you know you can't really do that but as you move forward you'll know more you'll understand more because now we have been challenged in such a way that we have to give an account of ourselves for things that used to we used to be able to take for granted. Well, we can't take yeah. anything for granted anymore. Everything's on the table, um, and so you have to return to first principles, and that's what the Ruth Institute does. We go back to the first principles. That's why we don't go to Baton Rouge and try to mess around with legislation because those guys don't think like that, and they and they kind of can't think like that. You know, they have they've got a different kind of task that they have to do. But I do think what we do can be informative and be helpful to them um, but that's not our role at all you know at all as as uh, the world gets weirder and the catholic church's teaching seems clearer and <laughs> it's 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 almost what senator feinstein said that the dogma sh is, is shining is um is, is speaking loudly now right you know but she she didn't realize that she should be listening to the dog. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if she wouldn't talk as loud, maybe we could hear. But right, right. Saying these topics. right. We've had a fantastic conversation, but I think one question we also try to ask our guests as we wrap up is, "What's one thing that you like to nerd out on?" Yes. What do I like to nerd out on? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Let me. I don't do nearly enough of this, but I actually like to read the the studies, the papers. Um, the, the studies that purport to show that um, sexual orientation change therapy is harmful to people or that it's helpful to people or whatever. Father Sullins and I did, you know, I have my own video podcast. Right. It's called the Dr. J Show. Okay. Yep. We did an episode, he and I did an episode together. It was, uh, 
I personally think it was hilarious. We had a ball. We just went through his paper line by line, table by table. And at one point he asked me, I, I said, so you know, tell people what that P stands for. You know, it's a, it's a, 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 a statistic of showing statistical significance, you know, explain what that means to them. And he goes, Your P -value. wow, you want to do that? I was like, <laughs> yeah, come on, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of fun. You should, you, you guys should watch that video. Even if you don't nerd out on statistics, I think you would appreciate the spirit of the thing. I already have, but I'll do it again. Oh, did, <laughs> is that so? Oh, great, great. Well, what's your favorite thing to nerd out on, guys? Oh, I'm the, I'm the video game guy. <laughs> As video it, games? I get, oh yeah, I got my stack of games that wow. spins. Whoa, <laughs> whoa. Look that keeps that. going. It's got wow. four sides. Um, and board games too, right up here. Board games. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lots of books over here. I got yeah. two St. Joseph uh, pictures. Right there. Okay. If I could do this backwards kind of thing. Oh yeah. That's just me. <laughs> yep. How about you, Colby? So right now, I am actually going through two things. Uh, I'm rereading Man and Woman, He Created Them, Theology of the Body by Pope John Paul II. Excellent. Um, and also trying to prep for grad school at some point in the future. Oh. Uh, I'm, so you mentioned the free market libertarians. Uh, I'm actually super deep into the Mises school right now. Oh. So I'm going through Very Human good. Action by Mises. Very good. That's very good. How about you, Scott? Well, I I love the confluence of like the Bible nerd and sci-fi and fantasy. So to that effect, I've written uh, the theology of sci-fi. <laughs> what? <laughs> and then Lord of the Rings and the Eucharist. Uh, I love nerding out on Tolkien's uh, yeah. Eucharistic theology in yeah. his that he put in his book so yeah yeah it's my favorite oh, that's very cool that's very i think cool. all of us in general lord of the rings oh yeah huge lord of the rings fans i think we had was it was that last year we watched all the extended editions of peter jackson's lord of the rings back to back we started oh. like 8 a.m and <laughs> went till went to like what like 8 p.m or something around there just a whole day marathon every and movie live, back to live back. stream the whole thing live stream the whole thing yeah so <laughs> Next time That's we great. do that, be on the lookout for an invitation, Dr. Morris. All right. All right. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. So am I on your list? Do I have to get, sign up for something or to get, to get, I'll, I'll have to like your channel. And yeah, there you go. You yeah, you can, yeah, we, get the, we get the Facebook oh, page. Yeah. Um, Scott will put yeah, that everyone. in our outro, how to subscribe. So yep. don't forget <laughs> to subscribe to this channel. Hit that bell down there so you can be notified of future content. Yeah. And do, and do that for the, Ruth Institute YouTube channel too, you guys. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes. That's yeah. what we need we'll to link, do. We'll link all that and then also maybe even sell a few tickets or at least virtual um, tickets or after tickets. Uh, we'll have all that in the show notes and promote it as best we can because we've got a lot of uh, Louisiana Catholic nerds. That's uh, great. That's yeah. great. So so let's state, let's state for the record because people will be watching this at different times, obviously. Uh, this is more evergreen kind of kind of content. The deadline for buying tickets for in-person uh, is midnight, Sunday night, the uh, June the 19th, okay? Because okay. Monday morning, when we walk in the office Monday morning, we got to shut that thing down and call the caterer with a number. And so if you want to come after that, you got to bring your own lunch. I mean, that's <laughs> all I can say to you. <laughs> because you know. You know, we got to let the guy know how many people are coming. But the, but the video should be available you know, to watch it, you know, at a later time. And it is evergreen content. So if you miss it and you're watching this show a year from now, um, all that stuff will be available at the Ruth Institute YouTube channel. It'll still be worth watching. So the virtual ticket, though, will still be on sale yep. to the conference. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what's y'all's website? Ruthinstitute.org. Perfect. Awesome. Ruthinstitute.org. Well, yep. it has been um, a delight, a pleasure to hang out with you, Dr. Morse, to, to nerd out with you. Um, maybe after the summit, we can bring it back in because there's so many more questions. I had, I asked you one of like, you know, 20 questions okay. I had prepared. Yeah. Right, so. right, right, right. And, and we should make some opportunities to meet face to face too. You know, that, that um, you guys should get over to Baton Rouge and y'all should come over here and, or, you know, whatever. 
yeah, whatever awesome. we should um, if you ever come to visit up at ivy Maria radio <laughs> hey, i'm there too <laughs> yeah 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 very good very good okay awesome well i'll do I'll do our little outro thank you for nerding out with us the catholic nerds this has been scott smith and colby allen eric dumont and the very wonderful dr jennifer robeck morse Please do subscribe to this podcast and share it with all your friends, Catholic or not. But And don't forget to spay and neuter your dogs and cats, folks, but not your children. Oh. <laughs> Signing off, this is the Catholic Nerds. I may, I may fix that. We try to always do some kind of little kitschy outro. Uh, no, I like it. I like it. I, I think it's great. You're doing your part to combat demographic winner. We love it. Awesome. All right. All right. Seal, Dr. Moore, seal of approval. It stays. There we go. All right. All right. We'll see you next week, fellas. Thank we'll you do. so much, Dr. Oh, thank Morris. you. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Great. Bye-bye. <laughs>